Today I'm going to show you how to create a living photo, also known as a cinemagraph. Hey everybody, Lindsay Adler here, and I've been creating cinemagraphs for almost a decade. But before we get into that, let's actually back up and talk about what is a cinemagraph. Sometimes I refer to them as living photographs, but fundamentally what they are is they are a still photo where a piece of that photo is moving continuously on a loop. That's it. Uh, one way that I sometimes think about this is like in Harry Potter when they have uh, the photos in the newspapers and they're moving repeatedly. I also think of that kind of like a cinemagraph. Uh, and cinemagraphs have been around the technology for quite a long time. Originally, they started as animated GIFs and now they have moved to high definition video stills. All right, so when I think of a cinemagraph, I'm thinking of some sort of interesting motion in the scene, something that catches your eye and holds your attention. In fact, studies have been done that when a cinemagraph is used in an advertisement compared to a still, it holds the viewer's attention for a much longer period of time. It's that little bit of motion, that little bit of extra interest that makes the person look longer, which of course for an advertiser is exactly what they want. I've been hired to shoot cinemagraphs for quite a few different reasons. I've shot them for TV shows, for liquor campaigns, for fashion editorials, and recently my cinemagraphs have found a new home. Now perhaps you checked out my videos on NFTs, non-fungible tokens, and it's the ability for photographers to sell their digital artwork as limited edition art online. And so I have a three video series that I've actually put in the description below so that you can check it out. This is a perfect place for cinemagraphs because yes, you can sell still photographs, but the fact that you're selling a digital asset, a digital element, having just a little bit of that motion, a little bit of something that makes it fundamentally digital, well, that is perfect for NFTs. So by the way, if you watch my video series on NFTs, you can actually see that the very first piece of artwork that I sold was in fact a cinemagraph. Before you shoot your first cinemagraph, you have to plan. The concept is going to be really important because you need to decide ahead of time what part of the frame is going to be moving. Now, as you think of the motion, there are going to be two different types of loops. Because remember, I said that motion is going to be repeating itself over and over and over again on the loop. So this will help you decide what motion is appropriate. So for the two types of loop, the first one is called a repeat loop. What that does is it plays the motion from the beginning to the end and then starts again from the beginning to the end. The other option is a bounce loop. So you start at the beginning, it plays the motion to the end, and then it reverses. So it plays from the end to the beginning, the beginning to the end over and over and over again. Now, as you're planning your motion, this is going to be really important because certain things will only work one way or the other. So for example, if you were planning your motion being a basketball bouncing through the frame, you would actually need that to be a repeat loop because it wouldn't make any sense for the basketball to bounce into the frame and then magically turn around and bounce the, the other direction. So this is why concept is really important. Our next consideration is gear. And let's start, of course, with lighting. Now there are a couple different approaches to cinemagraphs. You can, of course, shoot a still and animate it later on in post. But what we're going to be talking about and demonstrating today is how to capture video with motion and then later on make it a hybrid video still. Okay, so with lighting, you need to be using a constant light source. Now the easiest thing to do is use natural light go outdoors, use window light. But of course, you can also use constant light sources in the studio, like LED lights. In this case, I'm using the Forza 500s. I love them because they have a ton of output, a lot of variability, I can use a lot of different modifiers, and so I'm going to be using two in the setup today. Now my concept is going to be a little bit higher key and glowing, so I have one light on the background, lighting this background to be a pure white. And then my second Forza, again, no modifier, is actually bouncing into a V-flat world V-flat. When it bounces into that V-flat, bounces back towards my subject, it creates a really soft, broad light source. And then finally, because I want a higher key result, I don't want any shadows, I have another V-flat on the opposite side of the light just to fill in the shadows a little bit. So remember, I've got a setup here that is actually using constant light sources, but a window light would do the trick. So the next gear consideration you have, of course, is your camera. 
you're going to be recording video, so your camera needs video capabilities, but that's not a problem because most cameras today, DSLRs, mirrorless, can record video. But as you're selecting your camera, you may consider things like how much resolution can it record? What type of frame rate can you achieve? Because that decides how big a file you're going to work with, as well as if you can achieve slow motion. Today I'm going to be shooting with the Canon R5 and I'm going to use the Canon RF 24 to 105 lens. Now this combination is going to get me a nice tight headshot of my subject, but of course I can change my composition and get a wider frame if I want as well. The next gear consideration is going to be your choice of memory cards. When you're shooting stills, it is important to have fast read write speeds. However, as soon as you switch over to video, it becomes really important. So you need to do your research and make sure the memory cards that you choose are rated for video. It also depends on the resolution that you're going to be shooting and the frame rate because some cards won't be able to handle, for example, 4K or 8K video. So with my R5, if I'm shooting, for example, full HD and a regular frame rate, maybe 25 or 30 frames per second, I'm going to be able to shoot on a slightly slower card or use an SD card. But if I decide I wanna shoot 4K and I wanna shoot slow motion, then I'm going to need a CF Express card. Today I'm going to be using Lexar memory cards because they are more than fast enough to be able to handle what we're going to be capturing in this setup. Last, but of course not least, since we're recording video, you need to have a tripod. You don't need anything in particular as long as it's stable, but I'm going to be using a Manfrotto carbon fiber tripod. Before we shoot, we have to set up our camera. Now I'm going to be shooting video, but I also need to be set up in manual because I need to have the entire video clip be consistent. I don't want anything like aperture priority or something where some of the settings may change. It needs to be consistent throughout. I also wanna make sure I select the right exposure and the right white balance. Unlike shooting stills, and if you're shooting raw where you can make drastic changes to exposure and white balance, it's not the same when we're going to be shooting video. I wanna be much more precise to make sure I have everything right in camera. So the last decision that we need to make is in regards to both resolution and frame rate. So basically with resolution, it's how much information are you capturing? Am I going to be shooting at full HD, 4K, 8K, you know what, for this setup, let's keep it simple and I'm just going to shoot in HD. But then I have to consider the frame rate. Now frame rate is going to give you the ability to maybe shoot something in slow motion. So I am going to shoot just a little bit slower motion and I'm going to choose a frame rate of 60 frames per second. So we've got our concept, I've got my gear, I've got my lighting, so let's bring our subject on set. Hung, will you take a seat there for me? I'll grab my camera. The first thing I need to do is make sure that I have the right exposure. I'm going to adjust both my ISO and my aperture, but I wanna make sure that I choose a specific shutter speed. So the general rule of thumb is whatever frame rate that you selected, double that for your shutter speed. So I selected 60 frames per second, so my shutter speed is going to be 1 one twenty-fifth. All right, so I've got my 1 25th of a second and I'm going to shoot a wider aperture. Let's go to F4 and then I'll shoot at an ISO of 320. Okay, I have on my face and eye tracking. That looks good, let me frame up. And then I need to think about my concept. So the idea behind this is that she's going to be still, but I've very specifically selected this dress with the moving feathers. And so we're going to use a variable power floor fan. I'm going to turn this on, and so she's going to stay still, but those feathers, they're going to move. And I'm going to be able to loop this later on in post. What I could do is I could do a repeat loop where it plays from the beginning to the end, the beginning to the end, and then cross dissolve it so it kind of blends together. Or I could actually do in this one a bounce loop where the feathers move, it plays to the end, and then they reverse because you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. So what I need to do is I'm gonna have you hold really, really still. And uh, Benny, will you come and turn on the fan for me? Let's get a little bit of movement. And when I record, I want to record at least a couple of seconds. I recommend somewhere between six and 10 seconds. So you wanna make sure you're able to catch enough different variations in the movement of the feathers. Okay, so where your position is perfect, head straight onto me. And then I'm gonna click it in three, two, one, hold still. And so I'm watching one second, two second, three, four, five, six. Perfect. That looked great. Okay, I'm gonna do another clip so you can breathe. Exactly, totally. 
And then the same thing, I'm gonna have you actually face three quarters. So turn that way exactly. And then stick your chin out hard and then bring it down for me and then chin back towards me just a little, right there. Good. I'm gonna shoot a little wider on this one. Okay, and I'll tell you when, ready? On the count of three, three, two, and one. Okay, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. Perfect. Good, let me just record a couple more variations and then we'll take it over into post. All right, so we've captured a handful of different clips to work with, which I definitely recommend you do because you never know if the subject moved just a little bit or you didn't quite get the right motion. So I've got a few to work with and now we're going to pop over into the computer and turn it into a cinemagraph. Okay, so now it's time to take our video and turn it into a cinemagraph. And we're going to do so in a program called Cinemagraph Pro. Now, by the way, you can create cinemagraphs with Photoshop, with Premiere, with other video editing programs, but Cinemagraph Pro makes it extremely easy because that's exactly what the program is for. And so that's where I'm going to demo for you today. So I've opened up the video file and right now all you see is a still image. Fundamentally what I have to do here is I have to decide what parts of the video I'm going to allow to show through. So you'll notice that in the timeline down here, there's actually a time scrubbing across, kind of playing through, but no motion. Right now I have a brush. I'm selected on the brush option. And I can go ahead and paint in the areas where I want there to be motion. You'll also notice that if I mess up, there is a racer, so I can always change my mind. So I'm going to go ahead and roughly brush in the areas where I see movement, knowing that I may reduce this later on. Now one of the reasons I may have to reduce some of this motion is if my subject moved. And that's exactly what you see, for example, here. I'm gonna paint on her neck. You can see that she's kind of wiggled around a little bit, and so it's creating a problem with my blending. So what I can do is I can specifically erase off of the neck so that you won't see that problem area and only have the motion in the feathers and try to reduce it that way. Or I can go through and select a different part of the video because if I select a different part of the video, maybe she was a little bit more still. So what I can do, for example, is drag in on these in and out points. This is basically selecting the part of the video that I wanna showcase. What I'm going to do is I'm going to select a smaller part and ideally try to find a part where she's not moving quite as much. So like right there looks pretty still. And even though it's only a couple of seconds, I can make it work. Now, as I mentioned before, I was shooting at a higher frame rate in order to be able to slow down the file in post. So right now I'm actually at full speed, but I'm going to slow it down for a little bit of a dreamier look. Next, I need to figure out my loop. Do I want the file to play from the beginning to the end and then start over? Or do I want it to play from the beginning to the end and then play in reverse? In this case, you can see that it is currently called a repeat loop. You can see it plays to the end and then there's a little crossfade to start over in the beginning. I actually think a bounce loop is going to be better in this instance because the feathers will seamlessly bounce back in motion once you get to the edge of the frame with very little, uh, very little pause, very little distraction. So I'm just going to adjust this slightly and let's actually brush in a little bit more of the feathers moving. Yeah, that's pretty seamless. I like it how it is. So right now we have a video file where we've selected some motion. It plays from the beginning to the end, then the end to the beginning. Now there's one other thing that was moving in this frame that I'm considering including, and that was the edges of her hair. So what I can do is I can give this just a little test and include her hair and see if it works. And basically what I'm looking for are places where maybe it doesn't blend quite as well or where there's a little bit too much motion. And I can also go through and I can change the opacity of my brush or I can blend things just a little bit. Okay, I'm just gonna add a little bit of the hair here where I could tell that it wasn't blending clearly.
Okay, so now I have the hair moving seamlessly, the feathers on the dress blowing in the wind, and there's one other thing that I want to do to this file. I think the file could use a little retouching. Now granted, her skin looks gorgeous, so that's not really the problem. I can see a little bit of her contacts and I find that distracting, plus I want to increase the contrast of the photo. Now in Cinemagraph Pro, you actually do have the ability to go in and edit your photos and you can brighten up the exposure, you can decrease the saturation, you can do some of those basics. However, what I really want to do is remove something that's basically adjustments in Photoshop. So what we're going to do is we're going to navigate to the little picture icon. And as you can see here, it allows you to import and export images. So where I'm going to begin is by selecting the frame that I prefer of the video. So for example, I'm looking for the best expression or the best pose, and I can drag this little purple line to try to find where I like the expression and pose the best. And as you may notice, it was actually all pretty much the same. So I'm just gonna pick someplace in the middle at random, and then I will export that file. When I export, I have a PNG, which I can then bring into Photoshop. I can retouch, and then I can re-import it on top of this video file. And so I've already retouched this, so let's actually just bring in the retouched image. And I gave myself two different versions, one with a little less retouching, one with a little more. So let's bring in still image one. And you can see that the image is now retouched. For example, here's before, and then let's import it again. And here's after. Now, once I've brought in that Photoshop change, what I can do is I can make adjustments to the photo overall. So for example, I could adjust the tint to make it a little bit more pink. I could warm up the file a little bit. Maybe I'll bring down some of the saturation and brighten it up just a little, adjust the contrast. So these are going to be global changes. So the last thing I want to do before I export the file is look for any other mistakes. So for example, maybe I don't want the area of the neck there. Let's just remove that off. Okay, so let me just go ahead and remove that area from the animation. Okay, so before I export this file and get it ready for the internet, whether it's social media or a website, I just wanna do one final look. I wanna make sure I'm watching the file, looking for any clear giveaways of where I've masked in the movement, look for any errors, but so far, so good. So now it's time to export the image so that it will loop repeatedly. And so here in the top right-hand corner, I'm going to hit export. So what I can do is, first of all, I can select the export setting. You can do an animated GIF, for example. Uh, I'm going to do an MP4 because that is what plays nice with the different social platforms. So I can, for example, put this up on Instagram and it will auto loop. Then I can pick out the resolution. And if you recall, I shot at full HD, but if I were shooting at 4K, I could downsize here or pick some resolution in between. I can also pick my frame rate so I can have it play back a little bit more slowly, a little bit smoother. And then I can pick the number of repetitions. So this is going to play to the end and the beginning, but how many times do I want it to do that? Well, since it's an MP4, when I put it up on social, it will automatically loop, but maybe I want to put this in another platform or make sure it certainly does play repeatedly. So maybe I loop it twice, giving me a 30 second clip. I'm going to hit next and I'm going to give it a name. Let's call it Cinemagraph Demo. And I'm going to let it export, then we're going to open it up and look at the result. All right, so let's take a look at the MP4 we're working with here. It has a nice polished finish because of the retouch and the contrast that I've added. And I have a still image of her face. However, I'm able to introduce the motion in her hair and in her dress repeatedly on a loop over and over again, giving me a living photograph. As you can see, the post-production on a cinemagraph can really be very easy, as long as you have the right tools to help you out. But if you don't, you can definitely do this in Photoshop. I've taken you through the creation of a cinemagraph from start to finish, and I used a lot of different tools to make this artwork. So to check out the gear, be sure to check out the links in the description below, and of course, visit Adorama.com. Oh, by the way, I recommend that you subscribe to this channel because I have a lot more tutorials like this coming your way. 
And if you want to see more of my cinemagraphs, I put a link to my portfolio in the description as well. See you next time.